Dr. Bajua, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening very much. Uh, there is a problem with the video. It's okay, sir. Everything is yeah, I'll check. Uh, I'll check. being heard properly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Welcome to this edition of PG Online Classes. Before we start this session, Saraswati Namastukyam Varadi Kamarupini Vidyarambham Karishyami Siddhi Uh, may I now invite our honorary secretary, Dr. Bajwa, sir, to please address the August gathering. Thank you, Dr. Barun. Uh, first of all, this class was very much required for the all the students who had specially requested for the ABG. And we are very lucky to have the doyen of you know ABG, Dr. A.L. Minakshi Sundaram. Sari has been teaching ABG for I don't know for how many years now. So he's going to moderate. And Dr. Gunchen, she's a professor at DMC, Diana Medical College, Ludhiana, in the clinical care medicine department. And she has been doing, I know, for so many years. And she will be teaching us, sharing her experiences also. So this is going to be a very good class with the Moderator is now. I don't want to speak anything for Dr. Minakshi Sundaram because it is well known in India. Who is he? But still, as a formality sake, I request Dr. Parul, you go ahead with the introduction of our speaker and moderator. Thank we don't spend so this time here, please. Thanks. So for past for past few weeks, we have been taking classes for postgraduates appearing in the final exams. One of the topic which most of the students find difficult to comprehend is asset-based balance. Disorders of acid-base balance can create complications and a life-threatening risk factor. A thorough understanding of ABG is mandatory for any physician, intensivist, and anesthetist. It is no exception. So today we have two eminent faculty with us to help us understand this topic. And it is my honor to invite Dr. A, uh, Minakshi Sundram, sir, who is the Director of Medical Education. Though he needs no introduction, but just a few words about sir. Sir was Vice President of ISA National in 2016. He's won the appreciation certificate twice from His Excellency, the Governor and the Secretary of Government of Tamil Nadu. He has been awarded with the Best Teacher by Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University, Best Doctor Awardee by the Tamil Nadu Government. As he adorns a lot of hats, one of them is that he is a renowned poet and has won the Tamil Scholar Award for Tamil Nadu Government. He's won 10 appreciation certificates from Po different district collectors during the national celebrations. Senate member of Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University, sir is the academic advisor for the weekly webinar Puttukoti Budan for ISA Puttukoti. Our speaker today is Dr. Gunchil Paul, who is the professor of critical care medicine, Dayanand Medical College and Hospital. Her area of interest is medical ventilation and neurocritical care. She has more than 40 publications in international and national journals, and 10 chapters in a book. She is the organizing secretary for workshops on mechanical ventilation by branches of ISCCM in Punjab. She's an accredited teacher for IDCCM uh, DM in critical care and instructor for fundamental critical care support courses and ACLS and BLS. She's a secretary of the Ludhiana branch of ISCCM for 2021-23 and a zonal member of Society of Neurocritical Care. I welcome you, sir, and I welcome you, ma'am. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parul. I am really delighted to be the moderator. And I thank uh, Dr. Bajwa. Actually, he is Dr. Sukhminder Jit Singh Bajwa, a long-time uh, friend of mine. Uh, it is highly surprising this ISI has given me the opportunity, even though I am from this corner of uh, the country, and Dr. Bajwa is in that corner of the country, he is very close to me. We are close by heart. And we are happy to have him as a secretary, ISA National. And a lot has been said about Dr. Kunchan Paul, Madam. And uh, Madam is, uh, when she is interested in mechanical ventilation, definitely she will be much more acquainted with arterial blood gases. So you have selected the right teacher 
apt person anyway i will be learning from uh, dr kunchan madam because of dayananda medical college i have addressed the role of anesthesiologist in critical care i addressed a meeting in dayananda medical college i was invited uh, by sunil katyal at that time so i have been there so i am very happy to have see madam uh, from uh, ludhiana so without wasting much of the time i request madam uh, to deliver her lecture for the young post graduates thank you sir thank you uh, good evening everybody and uh, i would like to thank isa for giving me this opportunity and it is an honor to have such senior persons on the board and i think it will be a learning experience both for the vgs and for me also avg we know it is a little tedious topic and uh, i have tried to make it simple and i request the pgs uh, at any point if they feel that they want a re repetition they can write in the chat and i will repeat that uh, part Uh, sir my uh, slides are being shared yes ma'am okay so at the beginning we will start with the key features that i'll be covering is that there are various approaches to an abg uh, analysis and uh, we will be discussing the most common ones and uh, in in detail abg should always be analyzed in context to the patient we know we should not treat the investigations we have to uh to the uh, the patient uh, himself so we have to analyze the uh, abg in context to the patient always follow a step wise approach to the abg analysis and there are certain rules of thumb which you have to remember when you analyze the abg so why do we need an abg analysis it helps in diagnosing the metabolic abnormality going on in the patient it helps on in aids us in uh, altering our ventilator settings according to the need of the patient acid base status and serum electrolytes go hand in hand they are like made for each other so this might alter uh, acid base status might alter the electrolyte levels in a critically ill patients so before doing the analysis we should know that how to take an abg sample there are certain sources of error uh, earlier we used to take heparin in the syringe now we usually get pre filled syringes but if heparin has to be included in the syringe how much heparin has to be taken normally only 0.05 ml of anticoagulant is required for 1 ml of blood so in a 5 ml syringe with a 22 gauge 1 inch needle the dead space of that needle is 0.2 ml that means it has enough anticoagulate to um, enough anticoagulate uh, uh, heparin to anticoagulate 4 ml of blood so we just need to flush the syringe um, needle with the uh, anticoagulant because if it is more it is an acidic compound it will lead to decrease in the bicarbonate and the psea2 and the results will be more erroneous if the size of the syringe or the needle is bigger and the volume of the sample is small the second uh, point which can uh, modify or invalidate your result is the time in between the sample and the analysis because consumption of oxygen and production of carbon dioxide continues even after the sample has been drawn into the syringe so if, uh, if there is a time gap then you have to uh, ice this uh, keep it in an ice slurry our nice samples quickly become invalid why because there is a continuous rise in the co2 content CO2 content. If at 37 degrees, it will continue to increase one millimeter of mercury every 10 minutes. However, if it is decreased to 4 degree, that this decreases by 10 times. The change is only 0.1, and the change will be 0.001 if uh, in 10 minutes as compared to that at body temperature. The second source of errors are the air bubbles. Air we know has a PO2 high PO2 and uh, no uh, CO2. So mixing the sample will lead to uh, an increase in the PA2. content and decrease in the carbon dioxide partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the abg sample and if you mix it there is agitation of the sample with the air bubbles there is more surface area for diffusion and the error will be more so discard the sample if there are excessive air bubbles and immediately seal the sample after taking with a comb um if there the abg analyzes the report at normal body temperature so if there is severe degree of hypothermia or hypothermia that may also alter your uh, gas levels then uh, last is the type of the syringe the ph and the pco2 values are unaffected but the po2 uh, can alter 
because when we take the syringe, the sample in a glass syringe, there is minimum friction of the barrel. There is no pullback. But in a, a plastic syringe, we need to pull back, and there is uh, the risk of entraining the uh, air bubbles. And small air bubbles which adhere to the sides of the plastic syringe are difficult to expect. So glass syringes are preferred, but the difference is not of clinical much of clinical significance. So plastic syringes have been used, and they will uh, and they are continued to be used. So you have to uh, take care of three things, the air bubbles in the sample, the appropriate mixing with heparin and time of uh, analysis between a uh, time between the sample and the analysis. Do not cool the sample if the analysis within 30 minutes you have a machine installed in your ICU or OT. If the sample has a high WBC and a platelet content, you need uh, to analyze it more quickly because 0.1 ml of oxygen will be consumed per deciliter of blood uh, within 10 minutes, even in the patient with normal TL, uh, TLC count. So if there's an expected delay of more than 30 minutes, then you take the sample in a glass syringe and store it in an ice slurry because unnice samples quickly become invalid. Now coming to the, this was all about the uh, taking the sample and how to, uh, and um, before the analysis part, what are the sources of error? So now beginning with the analysis, of the ABG, like an ECG interpretation, you have to follow a systemic approach so that you reach the right uh, results. There are no shortcuts. So ABG has two components. First is the oxygenation, and second is the acid-base status. So uh, regarding the arterial oxygen tension, normal value in a healthy adult breathing room air is we know is about 97 to 100. And it decreases progressively with age, depending upon what is the FiO2 and the atmospheric pressure of oxygen. So we consider hypoxemia if the PA2 is less than 80 at room temperature, room air, patient breathing at room air. And most patients who require ABG are actually hypoxemic. So it is not advised to interrupt oxygen therapy before obtaining that is what you want to obtain the sample on room air. So these are the normal accepted values of PA2 varying with age. So at um, and this decreases one millimeters of mercury per year after the age of 60. Uh, that is, the PA2 decreases more than um, after value of 80. So if the patient has already been given oxygen, how do you know the patient is hypoxemic or not? It is a, just a rough estimate that the PA2 should be approximately five times. You can see it is approximately five times the FiO2 value. So even if, uh, if the PA2 is less than five times the FiO2, the patient is probably hypoxemic even at room air. So when you get an ABG report, this is the uh, all the details of the ABG what you will be getting. These are the sum of the values are the measured values, which include the pH, the PaCO2, and the PO2. Remember the bicarbonate which we get from the ABG is a uh, calculated value. It is not a measured value. We also get the oxygen content, the oxygen saturation, which is required for calculation of transport of oxygen, and the alveolar arterial oxygen difference. These All these values we get if you enter the temperature uh, the hemoglobin content and the FiO2 correctly. The alveolar arterial oxygen uh, difference is important because it helps us to find out the uh, differentiate between hypoventilation as a cause of hypoxia in a patient who's breathing uh, from a fixed um, FiO2, a gas exchange at fixed uh, FiO2. So we know the gas alveolar gas equation, that is the P alveolar oxygen is equal to the uh, barometric pressure minus the pre water vapor pressure multiplied by the FiO2 and uh, minus the PaCO2 divided by the respiratory quotient. So if the patient is breathing room air, the FiO2 is 0.21. Barometric pressure is 760 minus the water pressure that is 45. So this comes out to be 713 multiplied by 0.21 is 150 millimeters. And the alveolar pressure will be PiO2 minus the PCO2 divided by the respiratory quotient. That is 150 minus 40 divided by 0.8, which comes out to be 100. So this difference in the alveolar and arterial oxygen content is in the range of 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury normally. So this helps us to differentiate whether the cause of hypoxia is an oxygenation failure or ventilation failure in a patient who is breathing fixed FiO2. So you see here, the when both these... Uh, equations, the patient has hypoxia, the PA, 
PaO2 is 45. The uh, arterial oxygen content is 45. Uh, the patient who is breathing room air, the PiO2 is 150. If PCO2 is 40, then the alveolar oxygen content comes out to be 100. And this difference is increased, 55. However, if the patient is uh, the hypoventilating, there is ventilation failure, pump failure, the PaCO2 is high, 80. So 80 divided by 0.8 is 100. And the alveolar oxygen content decreases to 50. But there is hypoxia, but the alveolar arterial oxygen content uh, oxygen difference remains the same. So here the difference has increased. The cause of hypoxia is oxygenation. There is something uh, different uh, lung parenchyma. While here the arterial oxygen content uh, difference is maintained. So the cause of hypoxia is hyperventilation. This table will make things more clear. If PaCO2 is increased, then there is hypoventilation. And if the alveolar arterial oxygen uh, difference is normal, it is hypoventilation alone due to decreased respiratory drive or neuromuscular disease. However, if the PaCO2 is normal and the alveolar arterial oxygen uh, difference is also normal, then it means the cause of hypoxia is decreased inspired FiO2, which occurs at high altitude. But if the PaCO2 is normal and the alveolar arterial oxygen content is increased, there is difference. So it means there is either a shunt or a ventilation perfusion mismatch, which can be differentiated whether the PA2 is correctable with oxygen or not. Now coming to the second part, that is the acid-base disturbance. As I said, that we have to take the clinical history of the patient. We'll go in a stepwise manner, evaluating the ABG, but there are certain conditions which predispose to certain metabolic disorders. So it is advisable to take a clin relevant clinical history before approaching the ABG. So there are metabolic disorders which we know, uh, like a patient having diabetic history may come in diabetic ketoacidosis, history of hypertension, shock, may have lactate acidosis, renal failure, or patient is on drugs, will have uh, uh, reasons for uh, occurring, uh, coming for metabolic acidosis. While in the case of diuretic use, if there is vomiting or bicarbonate ad administration, they might produce metabolic alkalosis. Similarly, a patient of COPD, muscular weakness, these are the causes for producing respiratory acidosis, while sepsis, pregnancy, hepatic coma can lead to respiratory alkalosis. So always take a relevant clinical history. Now coming to the acid-based concept, as the definition given by Arrhenius, that acid is a substance that when uh, dissolved in water will produce the hydrogen ions, while this a substance which when dissolved in water produces hydroxyl ions is considered to be a base. But according to Bronsted and Lowry, acid is a substance which donates hydrogen ions and base is a substance which accepts hydrogen ions or protons. So acid-base concept is not only dependent on hydrogen ions, it is uh, considers the ions also, that is the anions which donate H ions are acid forming while cations are base forming. So there are three different approaches to acid-base status. The most commonly used, the traditional, conventional is the bicarbonate-centered approach or the Boston approach, also called the Danish approach. The second is the base access, uh, access approach or the Copenhagen approach. And third, we'll be talking about the physiochemical or the Stewart approach. I'll be discussing the basis of all three, but the more stress is on the traditional or the conventional bicarbonate approach. So before uh, uh, beginning the analysis, I want you to understand few terminologies. That is acidemia and alkalemia. Acidemia is when the blood pH is less than uh, 7.35. And alkalemia is when the blood pH is more than 7.45. In between, we take it normal, 7.35 to 45. So when the blood pH changes, it is acidemia or alkalemia. So this has been a result of some process going on in the body. And that process is acidosis or alkalosis, which results in acidemia or alkalemia. But body has some compensatory mechanism of uh, also. So acidosis, which is either due to increase in the production of hydrogen ions or loss of bicarbonate ions, may always not produce acidemia or alkalemia. Or similarly, alkalosis may be going on without alkalemia because of the compensation processes which try to return to the pH to normal. So for the purpose of calculation, we will take 
7.4 as the normal pH, a PCO2 of 40 and a bicarbonate of 24. So the compensatory mechanisms, uh, so the processes which lead to acidemia or alkalemia, if it is because of alteration in the ventilation and results in either excessive elimination or retention of carbon dioxide, the process is respiratory in origin. But if it is due to either loss of bicarbonates or retention of bicarbonates, then the process is metabolic. And the normal response of the respiratory or the kidney system to exchange result in the uh, change in the pH towards the normal is the compensatory mechanism. So the renal compensation starts after about few hours and it is completed in about two to five days. While if there is a metabolic alteration, the respiratory compensation starts immediately. So you've heard the terms acute respiratory acidosis or chronic respiratory acidosis, but metabolic respiratory acidosis or metabolic, metabolic um, acidosis or alkalosis is never acute or chronic. Why so? Because the lungs immediately start compensating for the metabolic disturbances. While if there is a metabolic disturbance, um, if there is a um, respiratory disturbance and the kidney has not yet started to compensate, it might, uh, that is in a few hours, it results in acute respiratory acidosis. And when the compensation becomes completed, the process becomes chronic respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. I hope I am clear. Metabolic process is never acute or chronic because respiratory compensations start compensating immediately. Now, the basic compensatory mechanism is always goes hand in hand with the change in the, uh, that is the bicarb will, if the, it is metabolic acidosis, bicarbs have decreased, the compensatory mechanism will always be in the same direction. That is decrease in bicarb will compensate it by decrease in the CO2. This is the basic component. This is the acidic component. So if there's metabolic alkalosis, there is increase in bicarb, it will be compensated by increase in pH. So there is always a uh, they always go same in hand. Similarly, in respiratory acidosis, if the PCO2 has increased, bicarbonate will increase to compensate the, the pH. But you can see as this compensation is in the same direction, if this is concordant with the change in pH, the disturbance is metabolic in origin. Here, you can see bicarbonate and CO2 are increasing. The pH is also increasing. So, there is a rule of concordance and discordance. If the change in bicarb and CO2 is same as the change in pH, the problem is metabolic. If there is discordant, bicarb and CO2 are decreasing, but the pH is increasing. So the problem is basically respiratory. So this is rule of concordance and discordance. Now coming to the Boston approach, the Basic, it basically is based on the henderson hasselbeck's equation. That is the basic um, and the only equation that is used in the um, Boston approach. And this equation is first used to uh, check the consistency. This, uh, the, it has been simplified. The equation has been simplified and rearranged. That is the HN concentration should be equal to 24 into the PCO2 divided by the bicarb level. So you have to check for the validity. That is the relationship of HI and CO2 and bicarbonate are maintained or not. So from the ABG, you will get the PACO2 value and the bicarbonate value and the HI value you will get by subtracting the last two digits of pH from 80. So if the pH is 7.20, the HI concentration will be 80 minus 20 is equal to 60. So HN concentration 60 into the bicarb divided by the PLCO2 should be equal to 24. Then it means the ABG is consistent and valid and we can proceed with the ABG analysis. Ma'am, could I just uh, stop you for a moment, ma'am? Uh, some of the students want to understand the concordance rule again and the... Okay. Discordance. I want you, uh, I want the students to be ready with uh, pen and uh, paper and pen because uh, don't use apps. They are available on the mobiles for ABG analysis. But if you do it with your hand, you analyze it, then only you will remember. So see the compensatory mechanism. This is the basic component. This is bicarb and this is the acidic part. 
So if there is acidosis, it means bicarbonate has decreased. This is the metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. Bicarbonate has decreased in metabolic acidosis. So in compensation, the CO2 will also decrease. So this compensatory part always goes hand in hand. If there is metabolic alkalosis, bicarbonate have increased, CO2 will always increase. Now you don't uh, look at this component, the compensatory response. See the change in the bicarb. If this, the process which is causing this, the, the acidemia or alkalemia is the same as the change in pH, that is the rule of concordance, then it is a metabolic process. The process is increase in bicarb and the pH is increased, so it is metabolic. The process which is causing it is decreased in CO2 is causing increase in pH. So this is discordant. So this is, that is the cause of this process is respiratory. If the process that is bicarbonate decrease is accompanied by decrease in pH, it is a metabolic origin. So because it is acidic, if this has increased and the pH has decreased, the cause is respiratory. I hope it is clear now. So now coming to the henderson hesselbeck equation. We have arranged, rearranged the equation and this is what we get. I want you to analyze this ABG and tell whether it is valid or not. A 54-year-old male, known case of diabetes since last 10 years, has come to emergency with respiratory distress and is on oxygen 2 liters per minute. His ABG is showing a pH of 7.2, PCO2 of 30, PO2 of 108 and bicarbonate of 15. So what do you think? So you can post your answers in the chat box. So rearranging this, H and concentration in a pH of 7.2 will be 80 minus 20 is equal to 60. 60 into bicarb 15 divided by PSO2 of 30. So this comes out to be Are there any answers in the chat box? Yes, ma'am. Ma Most of them are saying it is metabolic acidosis. There is an answer, metabolic acidosis with compensatory respiratory alkalosis. So I want you to interpret the validity of the report, not the diagnosis. So first, only if the report is valid, we will proceed further. It says uh, few of our people are saying not consistent. So it is not consistent. 60, 80 minus 20 is 60 into the bicarbonate 15 divided by the PCO2 30. So this is an inconsistent report. We should not analyze this report. However, here is a patient who is presented with vomiting. The ABG is showing a pH of 7.5, PCO2 of 44 and bicarbonate of 35. So 80 minus 50, the HN concentration is 30 into the bicarb divided by the PCO2. So, ma'am, we have an answer. Uh, somebody is saying it's metabolic alkalosis. Waiting for other people to solve the equation. The consistency of the report. Check for the It's a valid ABG, ma'am. It is a valid ABG. 30 into 35. 80 minus 50 is 30. Into 35 divided by 44 gives a same number 24. So, it is a valid ABG. Ma'am, there's a question at this point. Uh, Dr. Aman wants to know, how do we calculate the H value, hydrogen ion value? value? In most of the cases, in between pH of 7.2 to 7.5, it is calculated as 80 minus the two digits after the decimal point. Subtract two digits after the decimal point of pH from 80. That is, if the pH is 7.2, 80 minus 20 will give you the there are other rules also, but this is the simplest or you can. So if the report is valid, we begin with the steps to analyze our ABG. The first step is look at the pH. It, either it is acidic, acidemic or alkalemic. If the pH is less than 7.35, it is acidemic. If the pH is more than 7.45, it is alkalemic. Now look at the process which is causing this explain, explaining this acidemia or alkalemia. If there is acidosis, it means it is either because of decrease in the bicarb level or increase in the PaCO2 level. If it is because of decrease in the bicarb level, it is metabolic. 
If it is increase in the CO2, it is respiratory. So if it is alkalemia and the cause is increase in bicarb, it is metabolic. And if it is due to decrease in the PaCO2, it is respiratory. So first thing is look at the pH and then look at what process explains this acidemia or alkalemia. If this acidemia is due to decrease in bicarb, it is a metabolic process. If it is due to increase in the PaCO2, it is respiratory process. Now, if the primary disturbance is respiratory, then you have to find out whether the process, this disturbance is acute or chronic. There are many formulas. This is the simplified one, which I feel that is the change in pH is 0 0.008 times the change in CA, uh, PCO2. So I give you an example here. If the PCO2 is 80, the change in PCO2 is 80 minus 40, that is 40. If you multiply this 40 by 0 0.008, it comes out to be 0 0.32. So your pH will drop by 0 0.32 if the disturbance is an acute disturbance, acute respiratory acidosis. So pH should be equal to 0 0.7.08. However, if the process is a chronic process, the PCO2 has increased to 80, but it is a chronic process. The change in PCO2 is 40 multiplied by 0 0.003, that is 0 0.12. This difference, seven, the pH should decrease only by 0 0.12. So 7.4 minus 7.0 minus 0 0.12 will give us 7.28. So with a PCO2 of 80, if the pH is 7.08, it is an acute process. If the pH is 7.28, it is a chronic process. Or if it is in between the two, it is acute or chronic. The other thing you can do is, it is a little uh, different, you calculate the change in the H ion concentration. H ions we have calculated from 80 minus the two digits after the decimal. So if this is the pH, 80 minus 8, it is 72. 72 minus 40. 40 is the PCO2. Uh, 40 is the normal value of H ions. So 72 minus 40 will give us 32. So change in H ions is 32 and change in PCO2 is 40. So 32 divided by 40 is 0 0.08. So it means it is an acute respiratory acidosis. Same thing you can do by this. H ion concentration is 80 minus 28. That comes out to be 52. 52 minus the normal H ion concentration 40 is 12. So 12 divided by 40 is 0.3. So then it means it is a chronic respiratory acid. You can use either of the methods to find out whether the disturbance is acute or chronic. Why do we need to find out? Because we have to see the compensation. So if it is an acute process where the PCO2 has increased, so I told you they go hand in hand. If bicarb uh, PCO2 has increased, bicarbonate will increase. So if PCO2 increases by 10, bicarbonate will increase by 1 in an acute process. However, in chronic, if the PCO2 increases by 10, bicarbonate will increase by 4. So you can, this is for acidosis. And similarly for alkalosis, if PCO2 falls by 10, bicarb will fall by 2. And if uh, PCO2 falls by 10 in a chronic respiratory alkalosis, bicarb will fall by 4. So you can remember this as a 1, 4, 2, 4 rule. Acidosis, alkalosis, acute, chronic, acute, chronic, write 1, 4, 2, 4. And you remember in chronic, for every 10 millimeters change in PCO2, bicarb will change by 4. For acidosis, for every 10 millimeters change, it will fall, it will rise by 1. And in alkalosis, uh, acute process, it will fall by 2. There are variations. Some books say this 4 is replaced by 3.5 and this um, in alkalosis, this 4 is replaced by 5. So this is a general easy rule to remember. It can vary from book to book. So another exercise for you. Ma'am, please, uh, somebody is requesting you to show the step 3 again, please. Step 3 is you calculate the change in pH, how much the pH has changed. In an acute process, the pH will change more. It is 0 0.008 times the change in PCO2. Normal PCO2, I told you, 
for calculation we take as 40 the pso2 in this example has increased to 80 so 80 minus 40 is 40 the change of 40 multiplied by 0 0.008 gives us 0 0.32 so the ph should fall in acidosis acute respiratory acidosis ph should fall how much 7.4 minus 0.32 is 7.08 so if your abg ph is near this it is an acute process i have an example i think it will things will be clear with this so if the patient has a ph of 7.21 the pco2 has increased to 58 and the bicarbonate is 26 so here It is the pH has decreased, so there is acidemia. The what is causing either it is increase in the CO2 or fall in bicarbonate. Bicarbonate has not fallen, they are increased. So this is a respiratory process which is up causing this. So it is respiratory acidosis. So now we have to calculate whether it is acute or chronic. So first we calculate the H ion concentration. 80 minus 21 is 59. So the change in H ion concentration will be. 59 minus 40, that comes out to be 19. And the change in PCO2, 58 minus 40, that comes out to be 18. So the change in H ion concentration to the change in CO2 concentration, that is 19 by 18, it is approximately 1. It is more than 0.8. So it is an acute respiratory acidosis. And an acute respiratory acidosis, what is the Compensation of bicarb, it should be increased by every, for every 10 millimeters increase, it should increase by 1. So here it has increased 80, approximately even if we take 20, it should increase by 2. So it is appropriately compensated acute respiratory acidosis. So this is an exercise. 50-year-old COPD patient presenting with acute exacerbation, secondary to pneumonia. So this is the ABG. pH is 7.35, PCO2 is 60, bicarbonate is 32. Uh, our delegates can post their answers in the chat box. So what is the change in CO2? CO2 has increased by how many units? Twenty, ma'am. The answer and, is. And if you multiply twenty by point zero zero three, it comes out to be point zero six. So seven point five four minus seven point point zero six will give us seven point three four. So this comes out to be a case of chronic respiratory acidosis, ma'am. That is what our students are typing. Very good. Chronic respiratory acidosis. And for chronic respiratory acidosis, what should be the change in bicarb? For one, the change is four. So here the change is 20. So the change should be by eight. And then it means 24 plus eight comes out to be 32. So it is a case of chronic respiratory Compensate. acidosis. Compensate. Yes. So here it is a 25-year-old asthmatic patient presented with acute exacerbation, pH is 7.25, PSCO2 of 60 again, and a bicarbonate of 26. So again, applying the same rule, change in bicarbonate uh, CO2 is, this is acidemia explained by increase in CO2. So it is a respiratory process. The, the CO2 has increased from 40 to 60, that is 20. And now, if you multiply it by 0 0.008, it comes out to be 0.16. And if you subtract 0.16 or 15 from 40, the pH comes to be 7.25. So it is an acute process. And in acute process, the bicarbonate will change by 1 for every 10 millimeters. Here, the change is 20. So it will be changing by 2. The bicarbonate will rise by 2 and 26. So it is a... Acute. Ma'am, the answer is acute, uh, compensated respiratory acidosis. Acute compensatory respiratory acute acidosis. Compensated. That is what most of them have written. So I think they have followed the rules. So now a 20-year-old girl presents with an anxiety disorder and with breathing difficulty. 
the pH is 7.56, PaCO2 is 20 and bicarbonate is 20. So this pH is alkalosis more than 7.44. Alkalosis is being explained by either a fall in CO2 or a rise in bicarbonate. Bicarbonate have not increased. So the process is respiratory. The change in CO2 is? Respiratory what? alkalosis, ma'am. That is the answer we are getting. Yes. So what, acute or chronic? So we encourage our delegates to post the answers here. Acute, ma'am. There is an answer. Acute respiratory alkalosis. Another acute. Okay. So if you multiply 20 by 0 0.008, it comes out to be 0 0.16. If you add 7.4 plus 0.16, it is 7.56. So it is acute respiratory alkalosis. Patient is of anxiety disorder, probably hyperventilating. So it can acute respiratory alkalosis for every one millimeter, 10 millimeter fall in CO2, bicarbonate should decrease by two. So for the hair, the fall is, uh, the fall of CO2 is by 20. So it should be two multiplied by two, four. So it has 24, it has decreased to 20. So it is acute respiratory alkalosis. Ma'am, before we go any further, there's a query. Could you please solve it? Uh, someone wants to know, how do we know if the change is acute or chronic before calculating? Yes, before calculating. So you multiply this 20 by 0 0.003. It comes out to be 0 0.06. So if you add... 0 0.06, the pH will have been only 7.46 if it ha would have been a chronic disorder. If you multiply it by 0 0.008, it comes out to be 0 0.16. I, that is why I told you keep a paper pen in hand. Okay? Multiply 20 by 0 0.003. It is 0 0.06. Add this to 7.4. The change in pH will be less. It will be just 7.46. So it is a chronic disorder. So if you multiply it by 8, 0 0.008, you get it 0 0.16. You add 0 0.16 to 7.4, it is 7.56. So it is an acute disorder. You have to do it with both and see what, to what it is corresponding. Do the other example. A 60-year-old uh, male with alcoholic cirrhosis presented with increasing ascites. pH is again 7.44, alkalotic explained by decrease in the CA2, uh, PSEO2. It has decreased from 40 to 30. And the bicarbonate is also decreased. So the alkalosis is being explained by the respiratory process. Now, if you multiply this, decreases in 10, 0 0.008. So, uh, you add 0 0.08 to 7.4. So it should come to 7.48. If you multiply it with 3, it comes out to be uh, 0 0.003, it comes out to be 0 0.03. You add 0 0.03 to 7.4, it is 7.43. So it is more closer to a chronic process. I hope the example has now made it clear. You multiply yes. with both and see to what it has more uh, closer to. So if it is a chronic process, so with every 10 millimeters decrease, bicarb should decrease by 4. So they have decreased from 24 to 20. So it is pure chronic respiratory alkalosis. Maybe the patient is hyperventilating because of the increased ascites he's having. And that is what the answer uh, people have given, chronic respiratory alkalosis. Very good. So now if the disturbance is metabolic, this we have done. If the problem is respiratory, you multiply with 0 0.008, the change in CO2 and see the change in pH. If it is acute or chronic, then you have to see the compensation 1, 2, 4, 2 role. Now, if the problem is metabolic, then you have to see what is the respiratory uh, compensation. So for metabolic acidosis, uh, it is a very well-known equation, the Winters equation, that is 1.5 times the bicarbonate plus 8 plus minus 2. And for metabolic ex um, alkalosis, because the bicarbonate has increased, the PSO2 should increase. How much increase? What should be the expected PSO2? 0.7 times bicarbonate plus 21. There are different formulas. You can remember any of the one. And now in metabolic acidosis, PSO2 should, uh, the bicarbonate has decreased. So CO2 should decrease. But if the CO2 is more, 
than what is expected. So it means there is underlying hidden respiratory acidosis also. The bicarbonate should decrease in a metabolic process. So should the compensatory mechanism, the PaCO2 should also decrease. But if it is not decreased, it is more than what you are expected. You've calculated. And if it is more than that, it means there is hidden respiratory acidosis. Or if it is less than that, it means there is hidden respiratory alkalosis under. So here is an example for you. A 20-year-old girl with diabetes mellitus presented with blood sugar of 400 and she is feeling restless. The ABG shows a pH of 7.35, a PSCO2 of 35 and bicarbonate of 20. So here pH is less than 7.4. We take it to the acidosis. This acidosis is not being explained by respiratory part because the CO2 has not increased, but the bicarbonate has decreased. So the acidosis has been explained by the decrease in the bicarbonate. So it is a metabolic acidosis. So if it is a metabolic acidosis, what is the compensated PaCO2? Here is the formula for you. 1.5 times the bicarb plus 8 plus minus 2. So bicarbonate is 20. 20 into 1.5 comes out to be 30, 30 plus 8, 38 plus minus 2. So the range is 36 to 40. So it is approximately 35. So this is pure metabolic acidosis. So here is a 50-year-old man with cirrhosis, dyspepsia presenting with persistent vomiting. So the pH is 7.47, PaCO2 is 47, and the bicarb is 30. And let's wait for the answers. They're yes. just uh, calculating. Yes. So we have a metabolic alkalosis, compensated metabolic alkalosis, another metabolic alkalosis. So what is the expected PaCO2? You've calculated 30 into 0.7 plus 21 plus minus 2. So 30 into 0.7 is 21 plus 21, 44. So the range comes out to be 42 to 46. So this is 42 metabolic. plus minus 2. Yes, 42 to 46. So this comes out. So there's another general rule for metabolic compensation. If PaCO2 is equal to the last two digits of pH, it is pure metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. This stands for both. Here we have seen it is metabolic acidosis. The PaCO2 is 35. The last two digits are 3 and 5. Here metabolic alkalosis. So for a metabolic component, it is general rule. If you do not remember these, sorry, these formulas, Winter's formula, I think you must remember it's important. But it is a general rule that if the last two digits of the pH is corresponding to your PaCO2, then it is pure metabolic disturbance. Stands both for acidosis and alkalosis. So the next component comes, if there is metabolic acidosis, you've calculated the expected PCO2. Now comes that, is there an anion gap? Now what is anion gap? The major anions in the body are sodium and small quantities corresponded, uh, contributed by potassium, calcium, magnesium. And the major anions include uh, bicarbonate and chloride. So anion gap is the difference in the concentration of the major cations and the anions. Sodium, the major cation, and bicarbonate and chloride being the major anions. So there are small amount of unmeasured cations and unmeasured anions, but a major chunk is contributed by the proteins, which contribute a large amount to the unmeasured anions in the body. So this anion gap is basically the difference in the sodium minus the chloride and the bicarbonate value. We take a nephrologist include potassium also in the anion gap, but for intensive, it's mainly sodium minus chloride and bicarbonate. So if you include potassium, the range normally is taken 12 plus minus four. And if you include chloride, the range is 
8 plus minus 4. Now, in critic, because I told you albumin contributes to a major component of the unmeasured anions, if there is hypoalbuminemia, their anion gap will be showing will be falsely low. So for every one gram decrease in the albumin, the anion gap will decrease by 2.5 to 3 moles, millimoles. So there is a correction formula that has to be applied. That is 2.5 times the decrease in the albumin. If the albumin is um, 1.4, so the difference becomes 3 multiplied by 2.5 and that has to be added to the anion gap to get a corrected anion gap. Why do we want to see the anion gap? Because there are certain uh, disease states which will produce a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and there are various mnemonics for this. The most common which has been used is the mud pile, that is the methanol, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, feraldehyde, lactate infection, ethylene glycol, salicylates, they are the reasons for high anion gap metabolic acidosis and there are other reasons for normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So here uh, is a patient with a pH of 7.23. So there is acidemia. The acidemia is being contributed mainly by the decrease in the bicarb. So it is a metabolic process, metabolic acidosis. And I want you to calculate the anion gap in this patient. So sodium is 130, potassium is 6, chloride is 105, and you have a bicarbonate of 14. So the anion gap comes out to be 11. The albumin is just 1.5. So you, if you subtract 1.5 from 4.4 and add it to 2.5, the correction has to be applied 5.5. So because of hypoalbuminemia, you were getting a lower anion gap and the corrected anion gap in this patient is 60. Now, if there is an anion gap, then you have to find out, does, does this anion gap explain the change in bicarb? bicarb? Because for every single unit increase in the anion gap, the bicarbonate should decrease correspondingly. So the change in the anion gap and change in bicarbonate should actually be zero or we take a range of plus minus six. Or in other words, we can say the change in anion gap divided by the change in the bicarb should be in the range of one or uh, two. This happens commonly in patients like in the early uh, example I was talking, that is the anion gap has decreased. The anion gap in this patient is 16. So if you take an anion gap of 10, the change in the anion gap is 6. So bicarbonate should have been decreased by 6 from 24 to 6. But the change in and become 18, but the change is more. It has decreased further. So it means there is another process going on. So this value of anion gap and difference, or this we call as delta ratio, that is difference in anion gap and difference in bicarb is used to find out mixed disorders or hidden disorders in patients of anion, uh, high anion gap metabolic acids. Because for every one unit increase in the anion gap, the bicarbonate should fall by one. If the bicarbonate has decreased more than what is expected, this is in the denominator. So if it becomes more, the delta ratio will become less. So it means there is hidden another acidosis. And what is the other acidosis? In place, If the patient is having high anion gap met metabolic acidosis, the other acidosis can be normal anion gap metabolic acidosis also. But if the change in bicarbonate is less, the anion gap has increased, but the change in bicarbonate is less than the change in the anion gap. So the ratio becomes more than two. So it means bicarbonate has increased. There's an underlying metabolic alkalosis going on. I'll give you an example and make things more clear here. This commonly happens when in the, you get a patient of DK and uh, in patient is having high anion gap metabolic acidosis due to ketones. You start supplementing with uh, fluids with saline and there is a 
additional clearance of the anions bicarbonates are lost more so that leads to an additional normal anion gap metabolic acidosis associated with it. so here is the normal abg we take the ph of 7.4 normal pco2 40 bicarbonate of 24 and an anion gap of 12 is normal so if the abg see all these are showing acidosis the pH is less than 7.4 and this is contributed by decrease in the bicarb. So they are all patients of metabolic acidosis. So here calculate the anion gap, change in anion gap. If normal is 10 not 12, you can say. So the change in anion gap comes out to be 20 minus 12, you can 8 or 10. Here the change is 26. The anion gap is 26. So 26 minus 12 comes out to be 14. And here the anion gap is 20. So 20 minus 12 comes out, uh, 12 or 10 has been actually taken. It is 10. But the change in bicarb, it is 24 minus 14, 10. So the ratio is 1. For every 1 unit increase in the uh, anion gap, bicarbonate has decreased. So the ratio comes out to be 1. So it is a case of pure and a high an ion gap metabolic acidosis. Now, in this case, the change in an ion gap is 14, but the bicarbonate has decreased from 24 to 20. They should have decreased by 14, but they have decreased less. So it means there is an other process going on. The ratio becomes more than 2, that is approximately 3.5. So there is metabolic alkalosis going on also with this patient along with high an ion gap metabolic acidosis. Here, the bicarbonate has become 6. The change in an ion gap is 10. The bicarbonate should have become 14 if it was pure hyaline. But bicarbonate has decreased further. So it means there is another acidosis going on in this patient. So this ratio, this has become from 24 to 6. The so change is 18. 10 divided by 18 is less than 1. So this is a patient of high an ion gap and normal an ion gap metabolic acid. You need to calculate the anion gap. Then difference in anion gap, you take the normal value 10 or 12 and calculate the difference. Then you calculate the difference in the bicarb. The ratio will tell you whether it is metabolic alkalosis. If the value is more than 2, if it is less than 1, then it is both acidosis, high anion gap and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Are things clear? Yes, ma'am. So far, uh, they've not posted anything except that we had one query about albumin correction. Albumin correction. Hypoalbuminemia is common in critically ill patients when we see. And so you have to correct. For every one gram decrease in the albumin, the anion gap will decrease by 2. Point, some books say 2.4, some books uh, 2.5, some books say 3. So you can, from the normal albumin, if you know the correction formula for calcium, it is the same. The correction factor is 0.8 here. You calculate how much is the different albumin, how much uh, low is the albumin, multiply it by 2.5, that is the correction factor, and you add it to the anion gap to get the correct anion gap. Thank you so much, ma'am. So now beginning with the... Now, if you have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, that is, you have to find out it can be due to either retention of chlorine or loss of bicarbonate. And to find out the source of loss of bicarbonate, you calculate urinary anion gap. So for urinary anion gap, it is urinary sodium plus urinary potassium minus urinary chloride. If this difference is positive, then your source is probably renal. And that is most commonly renal tubular acidosis. If this difference comes out to be negative, then remember negative. So the gut is the cause. Then the source loss of bicarbonate is from the gut. So if it is positive in RTA, look at the urinary pH. If urinary pH is more than 6, it is type 1 RTA. If it is less than uh, 5 and associated with hyperkalemia, it is type 4 RTA. Otherwise, it is type 2 RTA. This you may or may not tell. So again, I have uh, especially put up this slide because I was an uh, observer in one of the exams and 
most of the students were not able to answer this question. The examiner was simply asking that just after passing the exam, you become a consultant and some your resident tells you the ABG on the phone call, how will you know it is a simple disorder or a mixed disorder? See, in simple disorder, the change in the bicarbonate and CO2 will be in the same direction. The first rule of compensation, they will always be in the same direction. So it is a simple disorder. But if the change in the PaCO2 and bicarbonate are in the opposite direction, then another process is going on besides the primary metabolic or respiratory disturbances. If they are in the opposite direction, that it indicates a mixed disorder. That is a general simple rule you must remember. So in a simple acid-based disturbances, if there's change in PCO2 and bicarbonate, obviously the pH will also change. So all the three variables will be abnormal. The change in bicarb and CO2 being in the same direction. So in mixed disorders, you can have any one value can also be normal. They are all three can be abnormal, but always CO2 and bicarb will be in the opposite direction, showing that there is another hidden disorder. Now, this was the most common approach, the, physio, uh, the Boston approach or the bicarbonate-based approach, but this has been um, criticized by saying that in according to this approach, the all the respiratory uh, the changes are shown by changes in the CO2 and metabolic disturbances are represented by change in bicarbonate. But actually, uh, the, we know that the bicarbonate is affected by both uh, respiratory as well as uh, metabolic disturbances and the relation between them is not um, consistent or linear bicarbonate in this uh, in the beginning only i tell in this type of uh, abg analysis bicarbonate is not uh, measured it is a calculated value the calculated value and the bicarbonate is not the only buffer so this approach basically ignores the complexity of multiple interacting chemical systems in the body so other approaches have been suggested like the copenhagen approach or the standard base excess approach so what is base excess that this approach has tried to replace bicarbonate with standard base excess that is the amount of acid or alkali needed to add it to the blood to bring the ph back to normal at uh, standard con con uh, conditions of pco2 of 40 and temperature of 37 and this acid or the definition for standard base excess is the same amount of acid or alkali added to the extracellular fluid to bring the ph to normal so base excess or base deficit is calculated in millimoles and it is considered negative if an alkali has to be added that means if it is acidosis the base excess will be negative if it is alkalosis and acid has to be added base excess is positive and the reverse is for base deficit that means if it is acidosis base deficit will be positive number and if it has alkalosis base deficit will be a negative number there are rules for compensation even in this because it is acute, in acute respiratory acidosis or alkalosis there is no compensation has become so standard base excess is zero in chronic acidosis respiratory acidosis or alkalosis Standard base excess is approximately half the change in PCO, PACO2. And in metabolic acidosis, the change in PACO2 is the same as change in uh, standard base excess. But this is, again, a complicated approach, cannot be applied easily at bedside, and cumbersome uh, uh, mathematical calculation derived from pH, hematocrit, and bicarbonate. And it boils down to the same thing, that in metabolic acidosis, the change in bicarbonate is the same as the change in um, base excess. Although it tried to replace bicarbonate, it could not. It come. Uh, it has almost the same um, clinically mean. Now the last approach, that is the physiochemical or the Stewart approach. Stewart was a Canadian physiologist who tried uh, suggested this approach long back in 1982. Little different from the other approaches, it is based on three laws: law of conservation of mass, uh, conservation of mass, law of electroneutrality, and the law of mass action. Law of conservation of mass says that mass can neither be created nor destroyed, but the amount of the substance remains the same. It just changes its nature. According to the law of mass action, when water is dissociated into H ions and OH ions, the product of the concentration of the hydrogen ions and the hydroxyl ions, which is the ionic product of water, remains constant. So if the hydroxyl ions decrease, there has to be an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration 
to keep the ionic product of water constant. So if the hydrogen concentration increases, that causes metabolic acidosis. However, if the concentration of the hydroxyl ion increases, there had to be a corresponding decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration, and that is the result for metabolic alkalosis. But this concentration of the hydrogen and hydroxyl ions, according to the Stewart approach, is dependent on three factors. The carbon dioxide levels, the strong ion difference, and the A total, that is the total concentration of the weak acids, which play a very important role in the Stewart approach. So how these strong ions affect the H ions and the OH ions is uh, explained by the law of electroneutrality. That is, in a solution, the amount of negative ions has to be equal to the amount of the positive ions to maintain electrical neutrality. So we know in the body, we have the positive ions, the cations are contributed by the sodium ions, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, mainly by the sodium ions, while the anions mainly contributed by the chlorides and the hydroxyl ions. So if there is an increase in the sodium ions, body cannot change the concentration of potassium, magnesium, or calcium, but dissociation of water can be affected and it can decrease the concentration of H ions or increase the concentration of OH ions. So if there is an increase in the chloride concentration, uh, chloride ions, so to maintain electrical neutrality, either the hydroxyl ions will decrease or there will be increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. So if there is an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, it will lead to metabolic acidosis. This is the explanation for hyperclonemic metabolic acidosis. The weak acids, they play a very important role in the understanding of Stewart's approach. The strong cations, that is the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, if they increase, there has to be a corresponding increase in the hydroxyl ions or decrease in the hydrogen ions. Decrease in the hydrogen ion means they will result in metabolic alkalosis. If there is decrease in the cations, that will be to maintain electrical neutrality, there will be increase in the H ion concentration leading to metabolic acidosis. If there is increase in the anions, strong anions, then the correspondingly hydroxyl ions will decrease or the hydrogen ions will increase, again causing metabolic acidosis. If strong ions decrease, negative anions, strong anions decrease, then there will be increase in the hydroxyl ions or decrease in the H ions causing metabolic alkalosis. The weak acids, although they do not have a strong effect directly on the pH, but they are so abundant in the body that if there is an alteration in the concentration of the weak acids, then also they will result either in metabolic acidosis or if they decrease, they will result in metabolic alkalosis. So what are strong ions? These are those ions which completely dissociate when dissolved in a solution, that is the sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium, while the others which are not completely dissociated, mainly albumin and phosphate contribute to the um, weak ions. So the strong ion difference, which is the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium concentration minus the concentration of basically the chloride ions. So if the chloride ions increase, the difference will decrease. And if this difference decreases, it will result in acidosis. So if normally the strong ion difference is 40, if the strong ion difference decreases, it results in metabolic acidosis. If the strong ion difference increases, it result in metabolic alkalosis. I'll explain it more clearly here. The main difference between the cations and the negative ions, which is contributed by chloride ion, is the strong ion difference. This strong ion difference should be explained by uh, the presence of some weak acids in the body, which mainly includes bicarbonate, albumin, that is the protein, and the phosphate. So weak acids, there are, but no. So this, this is called the effective strong ion difference. Normally, the strong, effective strong ion difference should be equal to the apparent strong ion difference. 
but if there are some unidentified anions present in the body like ketones sulfates formates salicylate then these will be a corresponding decrease in the bicarbonate value they have an uh, uh, direct uh, inverse reciprocate relationship there is an uh, increase in these unidentified anions they will be leading to decrease in the bicarbonate the strong ion difference will decrease but there will be there will be a lower uh, the strong ion effective strong ion difference will be still lower because of the presence of some unidentified ions and this difference in apparent strong ion difference which is the difference in the sodium and chloride sorry and the apparent and the effective is called the strong ion gap normally it should be zero but if they are present that means there is a hidden and uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis or in responding to the boston's approach so normally we know sodium 140 and chloride in the range of 104 so this difference is approximately 40 this is the strong ion difference and this should be equivalent to the concentration of corresponded by the number concentration of bicarbonate albumin and phosphate so if there is hyperchloremia the strong ion difference has decreased but there is a corresponding decrease in the bicarbonate value so the effective strong ion difference is also decreased however if there is the presence of some unmeasured anions although the bicarbonate has decreased the effective has decreased but the strong ion difference was 40 this is correspondent by a, the, it is unexplained by the decrease in bicarbonate albumin and phosphate so there are something else called present that is called the strong ion gap so this corresponds if strong ion uh, difference apparent and effective are equal then it is corresponding to the normal anion gap metabolic acidosis as we see in the boston's approach and if the uh, um, the strong ion difference effective is less than the apparent then there is presence of some strong ion gap that is corresponding to high anion gap metabolic acidosis in the boston's approach so here is an example for you the 40 year old alcoholic presenting in confusional state so even if you don't have the abg value from the electrolytes you can see the underlying metabolic disturbance the sodium is 132 but the chloride has decreased to 70 so the strong ion difference is 62 it means normally it should be 40 if it is increased forget the hyperchloremia it means there is metabolic alkalosis going on in this patient now this difference of 62 should be explained by the bicarbonate albumin and phosphate bicarbonate is 24 albumin is 3 so if you want to see the effective ionic charge on albumin that is um, the albumin multiplied by either 2.5 or 3 that is uh, taken as the convention and add phosphate so 3 into 3 is 9 plus 2 11 11 and 24 make up 35 so difference of 62 but we have an explanation only for the 35 so there is a metabolic acidosis caused by 22 mill uh, millimoles of yet an another strong anion so this patient has together metabolic alkalosis with high anion gap metabolic acidosis also so coming together to the summary of the steward approach if the strong ion difference is decreased there is low strong ion difference apparent but it is equal to the effective strong ion difference it is similar to normal anion gap metabolic acidosis but if the sida is low and the effective is still lower it means there is uh, sida acidosis which is similar to high anion gap metabolic acidosis if strong ion difference is increased this corresponds to metabolic alkalosis and it has other terms which it explains that is hyperalbuminemia causing acidosis is non volatile buffer acidosis and similarly hypoalbuminemia causing non volatile alkalosis so this although the steward had given this concept 40 years ago but again it is cumbersome not easily applied at the bedside so here is a uh, comparison of all the three approaches the boston's approach and the copenhagen approach are based on the bicarbonate theory and uh, the the invoked acid base theory is the bronsted uh, bronsted lorry theory while in the uh, steward's approach 
it, it, he basically follows the Ahenius concept and there is this uh, dissociation of water which cannot take place in the absence of strong ions. So strong ions have to be present and there's a major role contributed by the presence of weak acids. So although they tried to, um, the only, uh, the bicarbonate has been a fundamental approach uh, in the um, Boston's approach, but we know that the changes in the concentration of H ions and bicarbonates are not independent determinants of acid-base balance. They are the result of each other. The anderson hasselsbank equation has an important component of the Stewart approach itself, but it has not been able to rule out bicarbonate. It says that weak acids, although they have less charge, but they are so abundant in the body that they are changes also make a difference in the acid base balance. So all these, although try to uh, follow different paths, but they come out to be the resultant clinically application is the same. So to summarize, at the bedside, we follow the physiological and the conventional approach, look at the pH, decide what process is causing this disturbance in pH, either it is metabolic or respiratory. If the disturbance is primarily respiratory, then find out if it's acute or chronic, that is 0.008 or 0.003, you multiply or you check the ratio of change in H ions to the change in the CO2. If the ratio is more than 0.3, it is a chronic. If it is more than 0.8, it is acute disturbance. For a respiratory disorder, find out the renal compensation, that is the 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, uh, 1, 4, 2, 4 rule. If the disturbance is metabolic, then is the respiratory compensation appropriate? That is by either the Winters formula or the other metabolic or a simple mnemonic you can resemble. That is the last two digits of the pH are corresponding to the, uh, the PSCO2. It is a pure metabolic disturbance. If there is metabolic disturbances, find out the anion gap. And then lastly, see whether this change in anion gap <laughs> is explained by the change in the bicarbonate. So this is an article published in Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine written by me and my colleagues, although 10 years back, but all what have been discussed is here. And this is another very good article in NEJM, although an old article, but it explains the physiological approach of acid-based balance beautifully. So you must go through this NEJM article also. <laughs> and uh, any questions? And I have a few uh, Okay, some uh, examples for residents. If there is time, we can do that. Dr. Bajwa, <clears throat> Dr. Yeah. Bajwa, can I take uh, five minutes if time is allowed? Sir, your your domain now. Huh. So I think, uh, Madam, uh, Madam can stop sharing the slide. Okay, sir. Because I want. No, the thing is, first I want to inform the postgraduates. Uh, see, the number was 264, the highest number, the delegate attendance, that shows the power of the speaker, Dr. Kunchan, Madam, and another part, anxiety of the postgraduates. I want to tell all the postgraduates present over here, please don't get frightened the way in which they were answering. See, Madam has put her whole experience of more than 20 years in one hour, 20 minutes. It is very, very difficult for the postgraduates. So initially, they will be taken aback. So we have to have some simple guidelines. Madam has explained very clearly, even from the dead space of the syringe, plastic syringe or glass syringe. I think what Madam has omitted is uh, how to differentiate a venous and arterial blood sample. That is not at all necessary, but examiners will ask sometimes. Even I used to surprise. That is the only because I was keenly watching what she has left out. But Madam has explained the entire acid-base balance also, which is very difficult for the postgraduate to follow it within one hour, 20 minutes. So now, just because I am Dr. Bajwa has given me five minutes, two minutes over, within that three minutes, I want the postgraduates to take a paper and a pen. Please write the following points. Are you ready? Yes. First, you write the... 80 minus last two digits of uh, pH is hydrogen ion concentration. That is the first point you write. 80 minus, what Madam has said, I am also saying. 80 minus last two digits of pH is hydrogen ion concentration. Then, in metabolic acidosis, 
the expected PaCO2 is equal to last two digits of pH. In metabolic acidosis, the expected PaCO2 is equal to last two digits of pH. Now I am coming for the difficult uh, area that is madam was talking about 0 0.08, 0 0.03 that is the PaCO2 change for every PaCO2 change of 10 millimole this pH will change for acute it will be 0 0.08 for chronic it will be 0 0.03 so you please write for every 10 millimole change in PaCO2 for every 10 millimole change in PaCO2 in acute setup pH will change by 0 0.08 in a chronic setup for every 10 millimole change in a millimeter change in PaCO2 this pH will change to 0 0.03 why I am saying 0 0.08 and 0 0.03? See, 8 is composed of two threes. One three, another is a mirror image of three. You write 8, one is three, another one is reverse mirror image of three. So if you write 0 0.08, if you remember, automatically you will remember 0 0.03. So in PaCO2, 10 millimeter change in acute setup, pH will change by 0 0.08. In chronic setup, it will change by 0 0.03. Now, the postgraduates are going to write the complex uh, equation. You just write 1, 2, 3, 4. That is, 1 is acute respiratory acidosis. You write acute respiratory acidosis first. Below that, acute respiratory alkalosis. Number 3, chronic respiratory acidosis. Number four, chronic respiratory alkalosis. Even you can write it in abbreviated format because it is easy to write. I want you to write on the left side, acute respiratory acidosis, acute respiratory alkalosis, chronic respiratory acidosis, chronic respiratory alkalosis. So it is very simple as such. So the first point is acute respiratory acidosis. You know the carbon dioxide will rise in acute respiratory acidosis. So you write acute respiratory acidosis 10 millimeter carbon dioxide rise 10 millimeter carbon dioxide rise leads to put number one what is going to happen in the bicarbonate as carbon dioxide increases bicarb also increase they are changing in the same direction pH in the opposite direction so you write one for every 10 millimeter change in CO2 one millimeter uh, millimole change in bicarbonate. What you have written as number two, acute respiratory alkalosis. So the carbon dioxide is going to decrease. So you write for every 10 millimeter decrease in carbon dioxide leads to two millimole change in bicarb. Which direction? Decrease. So left side one two, right side one two. Number three you have written chronic respiratory acidosis for every 10 millimole change 10 millimeter change in carbon dioxide bicarb will increase by 3 millimole same way for chronic respiratory alkalosis carbon dioxide is going to decrease so for every 10 millimeter decrease in carbon dioxide there will be a decrease in 4 millimoles of bicarb so, 1, 2, 3, 4, right side you write, 1, 2, 3, 4. This side you write acute respiratory acidosis, alkalosis, chronic respiratory acidosis, alkalosis. Then, first you remember these six. Don't bother initially about strong ion difference, everything, because to learn ABG, it cannot be done within an hour. Madam has put it as a capsule. She has inserted multivitamin, even trace elements, even albumin, globulin, whatever, he has put it in a capsule and he has asked you to swallow. You could have swallowed, but how much you will get digest, I don't know. It is very, so first thing, don't bother because you have to live with the patient. You have to live with the patient to learn ABG. You have to live with the ventilator. That's what madam has done. She is in critical care and madam was also very fast because she wants to finish within time. See, this lecture, 
it has to be taken in a dual mode it cannot be explained in a lecture mode and i feel if madam has given it in if i say 20 into 1.5 is equal to 3 that and all it is very difficult 30 and all. if it is multiplied in the figure format this powerpoint we could have easily used what is what we could have put a arrow we could have put a circle but whatever it is i request the post graduates please don't get frightened you cannot become dr kunjan madam within overnight not possible because she is more experienced so the as days go by you will also have the same expertise but in icu you please live with the patient because sometimes every 2 hours every hour you may be checking a abg every time you can see then before reading abg i want to add one point without uh, that fio2 that's what madam has mentioned without fio2 don't read abg that is the only thing because with 100% oxygen the patient will have 100 uh, pao2 would have been alveolar pao2 may be 100 so she has mentioned clearly again i have put up my uh, email id and my phone number also the thing is i will not answer phone calls if you send a whatsapp message for post graduates if you send a whatsapp message asking your doubt or put a email i will call you at my leisure because this is my passion i have a passion for <clears throat> acid base balance mechanical ventilation and abg so i am readily available because of my official pre occupation i may not be able to to take your calls when you are in doubt but i will come back to you if you are having any doubt i thank dr baju i am seeing dr navin also who may have seen here uh, in theni uh, yesterday so i am very happy thanks dr bajwa the thanks dr parul jindal madam you will become a good comparer uh, you can even compare in uh, tv programs and uh, thank you dr kunjan uh, you, so you have recollected i am recollecting my days in uh, dayanand medical college it is excellent it is excellent but uh, we have to match the post grad you have ventilated very clearly the post graduates mind post graduates brain but whether they are having a perfusion adequately or there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch i don't know but i request the post graduates please don't be afraid we are here madam is there lot of delegates see 264 is unimaginable number that shows uh, the attraction of the speaker so thanks i have a comment that i want the uh, post graduates to practice this daily even yes. with the rules what the sir has written keep it in your pocket look at the formula and do it do it daily at least once or twice you will become as efficient within a month there will be no problem but do it practice don't follow the ibg apps don't put the values in this and try to learn from that so, that's what madam yes madam everything for everything we want to have a shortcut in the desktop yes, no, so for the shortcut in the desktop i am mentioning 1 2 3 4 so that they will easily will remember yes, sir, how to yes. recall it because everybody is asking uh, what is a mnemonic even yes. there is a short book in medicine mnemonic even to remember that mnemonic we have to have a mnemonic yes sir so that is a book everybody likes to have a shortcut that is the reason why we say please don't be afraid by seeing the abg as time goes by they will also learn if you practice daily you will learn yeah. practice next um, we have uh, dr malhotra think... sir with us and sir has raised his uh, no. hand sir would you like please say something uh, thank you uh, dr parul uh it makes me nostalgic because uh, this particular class was taken around here back by dr minakshi sundaram sir and uh, today he is moderating this class and uh, dr gunjan paul has really taken pains to explain everything in detail and both of you have clearly told that abg analysis and changing the treatment protocol is not just a left hand job it it requires practice and really thankful to both of you for such a wonderful session and sir uh, it's not only 264 views it crosses at times 500 also and the views on youtube are at least 10 times if yes. it is 264 within one month it will be more than 2000 views on youtube that's the strength of uh, isa uh, online pg classes and uh, the way you were explaining 
uh, was echoing the thing which you did yesterday in meticulous planning and execution of the ultrasound guided sono block uh, workshop which we conducted yesterday at ISA sponsored uh, workshop at Kheni where sir is uh, working as uh, uh, DME director of medical education and yes he is very right that because of some uh, official preoccupations he will be able to answer the queries on whatsapp and email but thank you to both of you for sparing your valuable time knowledge and experience with us uh, it was pleasure listening to both of you thank you very much thank you so much sir ma'am uh, can we take two questions which have cropped up in the chat box uh, sir ma'am the question is uh, bedside is it enough to just use the boston approach Ma'am, kindly unmute yourself. Yes, it is enough. It will basically tell you what is the, uh, if you have an ABG report and you analyze it systemically, systematically, it is enough to tell you what is going on in the patient and you alter your management record. And ma'am, the second question is, how to manage an acute uncompensated respiratory acidosis in a patient on mechanical ventilatory support with respiratory rate 30 and PEEP 10 and having AKI? This is another uh, respiratory patient with res respiratory acidosis. Uncompensated respiratory acidosis and with a respiratory rate 30 and PEEP 10 having AKI. PEEP 10. This is basically a patient of ARDS. There is uh, uh, this. So already you have increased the carbon um, uh, respiratory rate to 30. If there is an uh, I do not know what ventilation strategy he was using. Either he's on uh, what mode of ventilation. Basically, you need for an uncompensated respiratory acidosis, you need to increase the millet ventilation or you need to decrease uh, um, at the maximum. If you have tried that maximum, you can decrease the dead space, the circuit. Uh, I want to. Uh, so shall I take that question? Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. See, that is a tricky question. I think he is going for a renal transplant. That question, it may not be relevant now, but even I am interested in answering that question for uh, two reasons. One, in any kidney injury, when there is a metabolic acidosis, what I want to convey, when there is a metabolic acidosis, they will be ventilating the patient, but they will be producing respiratory alkalosis thinking that they are treating metabolic acidosis. But once that renal parameter is adjusted, by a renal transplant or by your electrolyte correction, the patient will go for uh, respiratory alkalosis. That they have to remember. Another thing, when a patient, that as we are anesthesiologist, if the patient is sedated, if the patient is sedated, he would have compensated. The respiratory rate of 30 is a compensatory phenomena by the patient. So if the patient is sedated like, with morphine or fentanyl, then the respiratory rate will come down then the acidosis will predominate. So it is a tricky and I want to know why the patient doesn't require any ventilation because in a patient on mechanical ventilation, uh, he is saying 30 with the 10 when the patient is having acute kidney injury, why the patient was ventilating with the PEEP 10, we don't know. So it is a case-based discussion. We can give only general guideline. It is case-based. Uh, so that is the way because if, when a patient is on mechanical ventilatory support, if the patient is having a respiratory rate of 30, then the ideology is not correct. Because if the patient is having a ventilatory rate of 35, it is an indication for mechanical ventilation. He is saying the patient is on mechanical ventilation with the respiratory rate of 30 means that the setting is wrong. It cannot be. It cannot be. It should not be. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, can we have uh, Dr. Bajwa, sir, with us? Sir, kindly unmute yourself, sir. Uh, unmute. Time left. Thank you, Parul. You are anchoring. I think you got a very good compliment from uh, the doyen of ABG. That Thank you, you so much, sir. And I think that's the way to go forward. So you can be the part of the ISA Cultural Club. So you can be comparing Thank anything so much, there. Thank you so much, sir. And... Uh, anyway, the Dr. Gunchan's actually, uh, she has put all her experience and everything into it. I was rather more anchoring to the class and listening again to her. 
and after a long long we were together in that MD doing MD also and at that time and from this time she has matured like anything in the way she was speaking as if I was attending a class myself I wanted I wanted to be a PG myself actually Thank it you. always happened like that when a good teacher teaches but ABG as I have said by Dr. Minakshi Sundaram sir also it's not an easy thing it cannot be understood in one class it needs practice and practice in a very concise and precise manner you have to have all the parameters and but you should have the knowledge also the clinical knowledge as well as the theoretical knowledge those go hand in hand when you are interpreting and analyzing a abg and technical parts i think it will be acquired within two three months period i think that is the learning curve how you take the sample and how you transport it and how you evaluate it so it's for all the post graduates and uh, you know sometimes the good teachers are the technicians they help you uh, teaching the right skills how to take the sample when you are a first year postgraduate, it's very difficult to take a sample even. But uh, whatever told in the class, I advise all the postgraduates to stick to the basics and learn the ABG in a very simplest of manner, as has been explained today. And whatever Dr. Nakshi Sundram sir has given, the points and tips, they are the real questions which will be asked by the examiner. Because a question paper has always also been sent by Dr. Nakshi Sundram. They should remember that. So those were the very good questions. And uh, overall, the class was good. Attendance or attendance is like that only. But then I think because postgraduates have duties also, they keep leaving in between uh, when it crosses 8 o'clock. So sometimes the night duties are also there. They're going to the night duties. Or sometimes the mess dinner is there. The time of the dinner is also there. But sometimes that's, these classes are important and they extend beyond the time. But overall, it was a wonderful class. And uh, the recording will be available on the YouTube and people can watch again in their OTs and critical care duties also. Uh, I was actually really excited to this, listen to this class and right in the evening also. And thanks, Dr. Gunchen. And we will keep listening from you. And Dr. Minakshi Sundram, sir, aap, you, aap, you keep blessing us always, coming to the stage and helping us all the, in all these ende academic endeavors. Your advice really means so much to us. You have been uh, Thank you. academically and at ISA level also, sir. We require your blessing always. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, sir. I think he is coming Naveen. from you. He parted thank from you and he is on the way. I think he hasn't reached home till now. Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> That's why. I am so on this, ISA duty. I am, on, I am on ISA duty. This is how ISA is working. The, all the dignitaries, forget about their age. They keep on traveling, academics, just to... Enlighten the academic knowledge. Uh, he is traveling from Thani to Dothak now. Just imagine, and uh, I think must have gone to hospital also to do his duties. <laughs> <laughs> he would have done that. Yeah, this is a real fact. I think we, I say, at ISA, people are doing everything for the academics, and the Thani was wonderful. Thani workshop, a work, cadaveric workshop, was wonderful. All the feedback are good. I think we should keep doing those things. Thank, Thank you. you very much from my side. Anybody wants to suggest something or give their opinions or ideas on one or two minutes, then we can wind up. Anybody wants to say something, they can raise their hand and can tell. So if uh, nobody comes forward, so Dr. Parul, up to you to end the session. Thank you so much, sir. Um, as you all have uh, said, this, this is a very uh, complicated topic and we need to uh, discuss it again and again. Uh, there's a somebody who wants you. Dr. Nita Bose. Dr. Nita Bose. Kindly unmute, unmute yourself. You. Unmute yourself, please. Dr. Nita Bose, your hand is raised on the screen, but you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. I think Dr. Nita is not available now. Not allowed. Uh, I'll just check, sir. Not allowed. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's my mistake. Actually, just wait. Just wait. Uh, let me do it. Uh, Dr. Nita. Dr. Nita. Yeah, good evening, dignitaries. I was just for this particular class. There is something known as an ABG card. You know, uh, the way sir has um, uh, summarized in the end, if that kind of card can be put up on the ISA website, it will be very useful pocket card for the residents to carry with them in the ICUs. 
it becomes uh, i mean i'm uh, abg is my pet topic so i had prepared one card for my resident so i mean uh, the way sir has explained it can be done and it will be very helpful so that's just one of, one of my suggestions nice idea nice idea nice idea, nice idea. Nice idea. Mm-hmm. good so we are available on our website and uh, on youtube so you can go back to this lecture again and again and understand the points which were not clear to you or you need to practice more So, sir, with your due permission, can we close the session? Yes, yes, please. Just, uh, just one request, Doctor Gunchal, you prepare that ABG card. We can upload onto the IS, yes. IISA yes, website okay. also, na? So I that it can become a ready reference for anybody who wants to log into IISA website and can check that thing. It will be done, sir. Thank, thank, and thank, thank you very much. It was an honor to give you, sir, Doctor Gunchal. Doctor Gunchal, uh-huh. you can you can take input from Doctor Nita Bose also. You okay, together, okay. both can do do it together, and yes, it's a very sure. nice idea. And very nice idea. It's a good idea. Yes, thank you so much. I will surely do, and it was a pleasure being with you, sir, Dr. Naveen and Dr. Minakshi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And with this, we come to an end of our session. Good night, everyone. Good night. Long live ISA. Jai Hind. <laughs>